Welcome, everybody. Oh, thank you. More applause. More applause. <laughs> He's a lawyer. He likes applause. <laughs> So, um, listen, I want to welcome you all. This, believe it or not, is the 14th production of Shakespeare in Law. So, my name is Dan Kelly. I'm a partner at the law firm of McCarter and English, and I'm also co-chair of the Boston Lawyers Chapter of the Federal Society. And we are so proud of our collaboration over these last, we took a two or three year hiatus. So, since the year 2000, um, the Federal Society and Commonwealth Shakespeare Company have had this incredible collaboration, and, and, and I just, uh, s just praise and am in wonder of Steve Mailer, who you'll get a chance to, speak, to hear in a few minutes. Our first show was The Merchant of Venice. It was done at Suffolk University, and Nancy Gertner, who was here tonight, played Portia, and I played her husband. And it was, <laughs> it was downhill after that. So and I want to say a little bit about the Federal Society. I mean, the Federal Society... Um, has always been a strong proponent of this event. It's, prob it's probably perhaps its most unique event that it does in all of its chapters nationwide. And I'm very, very happy to have Dean Reuter, who is its vice president and director of programs, here in the audience from Washington, who's going to be moderating the panel discussion. You know, the society was created in, in the early 1980s in the law schools and among the professors to really draw attention to traditional legal principles, to principles of limited government, separation of powers, individual freedom and responsibility, and the rule of law and, uh, and the public debate. And all of these principles uh, were embraced in the founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the, and the accompanying Bill of Rights. The, the, the goal of the society was to make sure that these documents were not just dead parchment, but that they infused and influenced the way lawyers and judges and legal scholars looked at questions in the 20th and now 21st century. It's sort of like what we're trying to do tonight. Take words that are over 1,400 years old, give them life, and then apply them to today's world and today's uh, issues that we face today. Of course, this is my favorite part of my introductory speech, the Federalist Society is named after the Federalist Papers which set out the foundation for the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And can anyone tell me who wrote the vast majority of the Federalist Papers? Alexander, Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton, right? <laughs> Hamilton. And the biggest hit on Broadway, Hamilton, has a number where Hamilton is writing the Federalist Papers. I mean, how cool is that, Dean Reuter, wherever you are, right? Why do you write like you're running out of time? He's writing the Federalist Papers. So, but Lin-Manuel Miranda's genius was to look at these founding principles and make them alive to contemporary audiences, right? And that's, so, so I'm hoping that someday we'll have a group of judges standing up here rapping out the lyrics of Hamilton. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? So a few, just a couple more things before I turn it over to Steve. First of all, I, I'm sorry to announce that David French, who's a, a great guy, terrific commentator, he had a, a health problem. I heard from him yesterday. He wasn't able to come. But Jennifer Braceris, who's also participating in the reading, is going to take his place as a guest panelist. So let's give Jennifer a hand when she comes out um, for, for uh, gamely taking over for David. Um, I also want to remind you that you're seeing a script in hand reading, right? Script in hand reading of some of the brightest stars in the legal community, community in the journalistic community, but not in the acting community, <laughs> all right? So, but, but our, what our participants lack in theatrical experience, they make up an enthusiasm and a true dedication to, to bring you the words of Shakespeare. We've had very limited rehearsals but um, I think we're a good group. We're a very proud troop, very proud band of players. But, the, but, but what we've always said here is that the words are the most important thing. Listen to his words. Listen to Shakespeare's words, even though if you read this play, or, or listen to them as if they are anew. Um, so the way this is going to work is after Steve speaks, I'm going to give a brief you know, Shakespeare Roman history for dummies course to orient you a little bit about what's going on in the play. 
And, and then we're going to have the reading, which will take about an hour, and then we're going to move right to the panel discussion. We're going to welcome Dean up to the stage, get rid of these music stands, and then go and talk. And there'll be a chance for taking questions from the audience as well. And last but not least, I want to thank my wonderful law firm, McCarter & English, for uh, allowing me to do this, for pouring its resources into this event, and the three angels, Caitlin Ahern, Diane Bluestein, and Dottie Moore, who um, without them, this would not be possible. So thank you to you. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. So yeah, I would say listen to all the words except those ones where he said something about killing all the lawyers. <laughs> well, we, it's we, not in this play. It's not in this play, yeah. but we should ignore those words. Right. Um, yeah, I, I'm a dead parchment guy, too. Uh, I started Commonwealth Shakespeare Company in 1996, and over 21 years now, we've uh, performed Free Shakespeare on the Boston Common. Well over a million people have seen those productions. I hope you all have seen them. Uh, we're also the theater in residence now at Babson College in Wellesley, and in addi addition to the work that we do on the Boston Common, we're also performing and programming work out at the Sorensen Center. I hope you'll come and check that out. I, too, would like to give a shout out to, first and foremost, Dan. Uh, who 14 years in, we still talk to each other, which is kind of a miracle. Um, uh, Dan is really the, the driver and the energy behind this, and the firm, his firm, McCarter English, has been a fantastic partner. Uh, Dan was a trustee of CSC, and he's just a, an amazing friend, and thank you so much. Thank I'd you. also like to thank another trustee, uh, Tad Hewer, who's a partner at Foley Hoag. Uh, thank you, Tad, for all the work that you did to help make this evening happen as well. And of course, again, a big shout out to the Federalist Society. This is an interesting group that brings people from all sides of the aisle uh, together to have robust and uh, respectful um, and provocative conversations. And you can actually do all of that at the same time, right? We will see <laughs> well, that with happen. Shakespeare, you can. Exactly. We will see that happen later tonight. I'd also again like to thank the sponsors of CSC, our, our great friends and sponsors, uh, Foley Hoag and McCarter English, and this amazing panel of judges and lawyers and journalists who are waiting in the wings, ready to go on. They've been fantastic. They've you know listened to everything that I've said. They've let me uh, browbeat them a little bit, uh, and uh, uh, and now I can't be sued in any city uh, of Massachusetts. <laughs> Which is a very good thing. That's why I do this. <laughs> and I, too, would like to thank the, the amazing staff of McCarter English and the awesome staff of CSC for making this event happen. Uh, I, I know you're going to love what you see tonight. I hope you'll consider making a contribution to Commonwealth Shakespeare Company. We are a nonprofit. We're really nonprofit because we give away our shows and like the free event that you're seeing here tonight. So your support really makes a huge difference. Uh, we actually are closing our fiscal year this Friday at 11.59, and I'm not counting. Um, so if you're so inclined to make a contribution to CSE either today or go online, we'd really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming out. We love this event. We love seeing Shakespeare through different prisms and letting Shakespeare be a part of the fabric of the conversation. Uh, and this is such a fun way to do that. So we're thrilled to have you here tonight, and I'm thrilled to pass it back to Dan to talk us through uh, Julius Caesar. Absolutely. All right, so I'm going to move over here. Thank you, Steve. And before I give my little introduction, I introduce to you and present the cast of Julius Caesar. So we got to begin with the big guy, right? William Shakespeare, our hero, the founder of our feast, the, the, the man who brought uh, Julius Caesar uh, out from the death of the Middle Ages and into his time and into our time, uh, whose 400-year-old plays continue to resonate because of the universal truths they tell about the human condition and because the writing's, you know, not bad. So uh, next slide. So, we're doing Julius Caesar, but how many people can name the other two what are called Roman plays that Shakespeare wrote? Do I hear any? Coriolanus and, well, Titus, we don't sort of, I was thinking of the sequel to Julius Caesar. Antony and Cleopatra, so can I have all of them up there? So these scholars call these the three Roman plays. Um, Caesar was actually written in, in 1599. Uh, Antony in 1607, and then Coriolanus in 1608. 
although Coriolanus concerns the events beginning at Rome's at the beginning of Rome's Republic after the expulsion of the Tarquin kings, the monarchy, in 509 BC. And 509 BC is when the Roman Republic began, while Caesar and its sequel, Antony and Cleopatra, take place some 500 years later at Rome's most pivotal point in its history, the death of the Republic and the establishment of Rome as a kingdom or a principate. So as I mentioned, Shakespeare really took these ancient texts uh, that were written about the lives of these great men and immortalized them, brought them back to life 1,600 years later. And so that the assassination of Julius Caesar, which took place on March 15th, 40 BC, and its aftermath had, became then and continued even up to the present day to be known and taught and influence events and public discourse. Now, if you look at the next slide, this is an unbelievable slide, an unbelievable picture. And you know why? This picture was taken on November 25th, 1864. It was a picture to commemorate a single benefit performance at the winter, what's now called the Winter Garden Theater on Broadway, at the time it was called the Booth Theater, where the participants were raising money to erect a statue of William Shakespeare in Central Park. And that, sent, that statue is still there today. And who were the participants? Well, on the right is Junius Booth, who played Julius Caesar. In the middle is Edwin Booth, one of the greatest actors of the 19th century, who played Brutus. And on the left is John Wilkes Booth, who played Mark Antony. Five months later, five months later, he assassinated perhaps our greatest president. And jumping off the balcony, he said, Six Semper Tyrannus! You know, words which were attributable, they're not in the play, but attributable to Brutus when he stabbed Julius Caesar. So talk about a play influencing events. And if we go to the next slide, um, I was shocked, maybe not shocked, but to see in the New York Times twice and the Wall Street Journal in their discussions and opinions, op-eds about the Trump-Clinton race, references to Julius Caesar and Caesar, and people are still using this play today to comment on contemporary events, and that's what we're going to do in the second half of this um, uh, uh, event. So, uh, although the play is called Julius Caesar, the character is not the leading role. He's dead by the second act. But it's his ghost, which is literally and figuratively that hangs over the play. Sorry for the family of, and clerks of Judge Barron, but he does die after the second act. Um, <laughs> See, his death is used by his allies, allies, his number two man, Mark Antony, and his heir and, and grandnephew, Octavius, to uproot an institution that had lasted 500 years, to put in the control of an empire into the hands of one man, a king, so that by 27 BC, after defeating the forces of Mark Antony, Octavius becomes Augustus, is declared supreme and absolute ruler and is also declared a god. So for the next few minutes, if any of you have any passing interest or knowledge of Roman history, please forgive me <laughs> for my dissertation, a uh, brief dissertation about what was going on at Rome at the time. So if we look at the next slide, what's important to know that in 40 BC, the time when Julius Caesar was assassinated, the time when it was still a republic, it was already an empire. It stretched, as you can see, from southern Britain all the way to northern Africa and to Asia. Um, but its system of government was rooted in a variety of institutions which ideally proved served as checks and balances against each other, and whose institutions were primarily um, um, made up of people who were elected, elected by citizens of Rome. So if I could have the next slide. You see references to all of these things at some point or another in the play, and it's important to talk a little bit about them. 
So by the time of Caesar's death, all men, sorry women, who were not slaves or immigrants from client states who lived in what is roughly Italy today were granted Roman citizenship. Citizenship was wildly, widely held by people of all, in, in, by men in all economic strata in, in Rome at the time. And citizenship gave people some pretty good rights, the right to vote in Roman assemblies, to stand for public office, to make legal contracts, to hold property, to sue in the courts, to have a trial and appeal from decisions of magistrates. Now, there were two different classes of citizens. There were the patricians and the plebeians, or what Shakespeare refers to as the commoners. Uh, the patricians were a very narrow set of the community, very well, most of them very wealthy, having names which were very old. The plebeians made up the vast majority of the citizens, and they were the workers. They were the people who made the shoes and, and uh, made the garments and, and, and who made the society work. Um, as for government, the executive power was concentrated in two individuals. They were called consuls, and the consuls were recommended by the Senate, and they were elected by the assembly. Uh, which And these assemblies were not um, like our House of Representatives or Senate. They were actually groups of citizens who would get together and do things that were run by a magistrate. So you have two consuls who were in charge of the executive uh, management, of the exec management of the state who only had one term apiece, and they, each one could veto the other. So they were charged with executing the laws that were passed by the assemblies or recommended by the Senate. There was a separate judicial system. And as I said, the consuls were term limited. They were only supposed to be in place for a year. And what would typically happen is they would go on to be a governor of one of the city states or countries that Rome had conquered and created that empire that I showed you. Um, the Roman Senate, the Roman Senate was an advisory council that had strong, strong influence in terms of the way in which Rome was governed. They, by the time of Caesar, there were up to eight or 900 of them. Their membership was controlled um, and limited to um, primarily men of very wealthy means. There was a, a, a particular amount that had to be contributed in order to be a member of the Senate. But once you were a member of the Senate, you were a member for life. Um, they directed military campaigns. They managed the budget. They administered the provinces. Um, they had an enormous amount of power. Now, one other group I want to talk about are the tribunes. The tribunes were, pe were men who were elected by the plebeians to represent the plebeians. And they were served in bodies of 10. And they had the power to veto any legislation on behalf of the plebeians. And in the opening scene of Julius Caesar, you see two tribunes, supposedly representatives of the people, complaining about the people complaining about the commoners uh, and how they are now moving against them and moving towards signs of worship of this cult of Julius Caesar. So let's talk about Caesar, if I could have the next slide. Um, he was born into a patrician family. In his early life, there was a time of struggle in Rome between powerful men who were appointed dictators, and success depended upon which dictator was in favor. So he made a name for himself in the military, and um, engaged in great battles and great victories. He rose up in the military and political ranks. He held positions in the army and in the state religion. He was the governor of Spain, which was a prestigious appointment. And then by 59 BC, he became one of those consuls that I talked to you about, the top dog. At that time, he formed what's called the triumvirate. If I could have the next slide. This was between Crassus Pompey, Pompey is a name you'll hear in the play, uh, and Caesar. Um, these three gentlemen controlled in many respects the governance of Rome for some time, although all of the is, these institutional bodies remained in place. Um, once Caesar became a consul, um, he, after his term was up, he moved over to be the governor of what's now southern France. 
He had four legions at his command. He conquered rebel tribes and took, all, took over all of France. He even moved north into southern Britain. And according to Plutarch, during these military escapades, his army fought three million men. One million died, another million were enslaved, and 300 tribes were subjugated and destroyed 800 cities. Caesar became a very, very powerful, renowned general, having control over vast amounts of territory and vast amounts of men. During this time, Pompey and Crassus started quarreling. Crassus wound up dying in a military campaign, which left only Pompey. And um, so Pompey's in Rome. Caesar is making this enormous fortune and name for himself outside the gates of Rome. So Pompey is fearful of Caesar's uh, power. So Pompey orders Caesar to give up his army, to come back to Rome. And Caesar, Caesar fears that he's going to be prosecuted. He's going to be, he's going to be imprisoned by Pompey. So Caesar makes the fateful decision of, what does he do? He crosses the Rubicon. So if we could have a picture of that. That's a very glorified, <laughs> idealistic portrait of Caesar crossing the Rubicon. I like the next slide. This is how it was portrayed in HBO's series, Rome. <laughs> That's what the Rubicon actually looked like, which was a river between Italy and, and north of Italy. And by coming into Rome and bringing his army with him, he ignited a civil war which eventually led to the death of Pompey and Caesar coming back and taking control as another, as a consul, um, still with all of these institutions in place, but having a great deal of power and, and, and creating a great deal of trepidation among the senators and the other people who, who held the other levers of power about what he was going to do with that power, right? So if I have the next slide, so during this period of time between crossing the Rubicon, 49 BC, and his assassination, he established a new constitution, he centralized power, he, did, he engaged in a number of, of acts which made the, the, the Rome itself more powerful in terms of the, the, its control on the provinces and control on the people. Um, next slide. Uh, another interesting fact is he reformed the calendar. He adopted the Egyptian calendar and that's why we have two extra months. And you know what those two extra months are? July and August. Julius and Augustus is, isn't that amazing? We still have July and August. So if I could have the next slide. Um, so the play begins on the Feast of the Lupercal, which is an ancient, ancient feast which celebrates the founding of Rome. And what, what Caesar does, which you hear people talking about in the play, is he holds a triumph. Shakespeare actually conflates two events in the first scene. Caesar holds a triumph, which is a grand parade um, in which he um, exalts himself through the streets of Rome in celebration of his victory of Pompey, which is something that had never been done before, a triumph being held in to celebrate or commemorate the victory over another Roman as opposed to a foreign enemy. And at the same time, he appoints himself dictator for life, which causes great anxiety among the senators. So who are our key players? Well, there's Caesar, of course. And then we have the reluctant Stoic, Mark An uh, Stoic uh, Brutus, here played by um, John Galegood, a very young John Galegood in the 1953 movie. And, and the, the um, attack dog, Cassius, who's referred to as an Epicurean, who was played by James Mason. Oh, reverse. Are you sure about that? <laughs> Could I possibly have one fact wrong? Anyway. See, this is great. I love, I let, you're still alive out there, which is really good. All right. Um, uh, so, and, and of course, uh, uh, another important character is Caesar's ally, Mark Antony. I have that one right, right? Um, that's, uh, does everyone know who that is? Marlon Brando, if we go to the next slide. That's the, this actor's name is James Purifoy. He played Mark Antony in, 
in um, the HBO series. And of course, the, the major, another major player in this play are the citizens themselves who really are manipulated in such a way uh, um, so that uh, by the end of the play, the republic is no more. But the citizens play a key role in that manipulation, which is something that we, I think we'll, we'll talk about when the panel begins. Now, um, uh, of course, after the play is over, Mark Antony and uh, Octavius, who you see at the very end of the play joining hands uh, and um, singing Kumbaya, they eventually clash, uh, which leads to the death of Mark Antony in Egypt, he commits suicide with Cleopatra, and Octavius becomes the single Roman emperor. He's later called Augustus. I think we have a statue. That's, that's him, I think. Um, he's called Augustus, and the Republic is dead. And he's not only declared king, but he's also declared to be a god. Now, I want to show you the next slide. The next slide is a very idealistic portrayal of the assassination of Julius Caesar. I love how the arms are outstretched like this. But this is a play of dramatic intensity. We're great, decent, honorable men decided they were going to commit the bloodiest of acts to save the Republic. And we as actors here cannot do justice to the bloody, the bloodiness, the, 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 the terrible, terrifying thing that they did. But it's really important to understand that these great patricians, these senators, engaged in this act. And the only way that I thought of that could really convey the, 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 the visceral quality of what happened um, is to show you how HBO did it. So we're going to run that, <laughs> if you don't mind. He was with us a moment ago. Never mind.
I give you Julius Caesar. <laughs> Hence, home, you idle creatures. Get you home. Speak, what trade art thou? Why, sir, a carpenter. Where is thy leather apron and thy rule? What dost thou with the, thy best apparel on? You, sir, what trade are you? Truly, sir, in respect of a fine workman I am, but as you would say, a cobbler. But wherefore art not in thy shop today? Why dost thou lead these men about the streets? Truly, sir, to wear out their shoes so as to get myself into more work. But indeed, sir, we make holiday to see Caesar and rejoice in his triumph. Wherefore rejoice? What conquest brings he home? What tributaries follow him to Rome? To grace in captive bonds his chariot wheels. You blocks, you stones, you worse than senseless things. Oh, you hard hearts, you cruel men of Rome. Knew you not Pompey? Many a time and oft have you climbed up to walls and battlements, to towers and windows, yea, to chimney tops, your infants in your arms, and there have sat the livelong day with patient expectation to see great Pompey pass the streets of Rome. And do you now put on your best attire? And do you now cull out a holiday? And do you now strew flowers in his way that comes in triumph over Pompey's blood? Be gone, run to your houses, fall upon your knees, pray to the gods to intermit the plague that needs must light on this ingratitude. Go, go, good countrymen, and for this fault assemble all the poor men of your sort. Draw them to Tiber banks and weep your tears into the channel till the lowest stream do kiss the most exalted shores of all. See whether their basest metal be not moved. They vanish tongue-tied in their guiltiness. Go you down that way towards the capital. This way will I disrobe the images if you define them decked with ceremonies. May we do so? You know it is the Feast of Lupercal. Tis no matter. Let no images be hung with Caesar's trophies. I'll about and drive the vulgar from the streets. So do you too, where you perceive them thick. These growing feathers plucked from Caesar's wing will make him fly at ordinary pitch. Who else would soar above the view of men and keep us all in servile fearfulness? Set on and leave no ceremony out. Caesar. Ah, who calls? Bid every noise be still, peace yet again. Who is it in the press that calls on me? I hear a tongue, shriller than all the music, cry, Caesar, speak. Caesar is turned to hear. Beware the Ides of March. What man is that? A soothsayer bids you beware the Ides of March. Set him before me, let me see his face. Fellow, come from the throng, look upon Caesar. What sayest thou to me? Speak once again. Beware the Ides of Mars. He is a dreamer. Let us leave him. Pass. Will you go see the order of the course? Not I. I pray you do. I am not gamesome. I do lack some part of that quick spirit that is in Antony. Let me not hinder Cassius your desires. I will leave you. Brutus, I do observe you now of late. I have not from your eyes that gentleness and show of love as I was wont to have. You bear too stubborn and too strange a hand over your friend that loves you. Cassius, be not deceived. If I have availed my look, I turn the trouble of my countenance merely upon myself. Vexed I am of late with passions of some difference, conceptions only proper to myself, which give some soil, perhaps, to my behavior. And Brutus, I have much mistook your passion by means whereof this breast of mine hath buried thoughts of great value, worthy cogitations. Tell me, Brutus, can you see your face? No, Cassius, for the eye sees not itself, but by reflection, by some other things. Tis just, and it is very much lamented, Brutus, that you have no <clears throat> such mirrors as will turn your hidden worthiness into your eye, that you might see your shadow. I have heard where many of the best respect in Rome, except immortal Caesar, speaking of Brutus and groaning underneath this age's yoke, have wished that noble Brutus had their eyes. 
Into what dangers would you lead me, Cassius, that you would have me seek into myself for that which is not in me? Therefore, good Brutus, be prepared to hear. And since you know you cannot see yourself so well by reflection, I, your glass, will modestly discover to yourself that of yourself which you yet know not of. Hail Caesar! Caesar. Caesar. Hail Caesar. Caesar. Caesar! What means this shouting? I do fear the people choose Caesar for their king. I do fear it? Then must I think you would not have it so? I would not, Cassius. Yet I love him well. But wherefore do you hold me here for so long? What is it that you would impart to me? If it be aught toward the general good, set honor in one eye and death in the other, and I will look on both indifferently. For let the gods so speed me, as I love the name of honor more than I fear death. I know that virtue to be in you, Brutus, as well as I do know your outward favor. Well, honor is the subject of my story. I was born free as Caesar, so were you. We both have fed as well, and we can both endure the winter's cold as well as he. He had a fever when he was in Spain. And when the fit was on him, I did mark how he did shake. Tis true, this god did shake. His coward lips did from their color fly, and that same eye, whose bend doth all the world, did lose his luster. Another general shout. I do believe that these applauses are for some new honors that are heaped on Caesar. My man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus. And we petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Brutus and Caesar. What should be in that Caesar? Why should that name be sounded more than yours? Now, in the name of all the gods at once, upon what meat does this our Caesar feed, that he is grown so great? Age, thou art shamed. Rome, thou hast lost the breed of noble bloods. That you do love me, I am nothing jealous. What you would work me to, I have some aim. How I have thought of this and of these times, I shall recount hereafter. For this present, I would not, so with love I might entreat you, be any further moved. What you have said, I will consider. What you have to say, I will with patience hear, and find a time both meet to hear and answer such high things. Till then, my noble friend, chew upon this. Brutus had rather be a villager than to repute himself a son of Rome under these hard conditions as this time is like to lay upon us. I'm glad that my weak words have struck but this must show of fire in Brutus. The games are done and Caesar is returning. Look, you Cassius, the angry spot doth glow on Caesar's brow, and all the rest look like a chidden train. Cascus, Casca will tell us what the matter is. Antonius? Caesar? Let me have men about me that are fat, sleek-headed men, and such as sleep o' nights. Yon Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. Fear him not, Caesar, he's not dangerous. He is a noble Roman and well given. You pulled me by the cloak. Would you speak to me? Aye, Casca, tell us what hath chanced today that Caesar looks so sad. I can as well be hanged to tell the manner of it. It was mere foolery. I did not mark it. I saw Mark Antony offer him a crown. Yet it was not a crown neither. It was one of those coronets. And as I told you, he put it by once. But for all that, to my thinking, he would fain have had it. Then he offered it to him again, and he put it by again. But to my thinking, he was very loath to lay his fingers off it. And then he offered it a third time. He put it the third time by, and still he refused it. 
And the rabblemen hooted and clapped their chopped hands and threw up their sweaty nightcaps and uttered such a deal of stinking breath because Caesar refused the crown that it almost choked Caesar. For he swooned and he fell down at it. And for my own part, I durst not laugh for fear of opening my lips and receiving the bad air myself. But soft, I pray you, what? Did Caesar swoon? He fell down in the marketplace and foamed at the mouth and was speechless. Tis very like he hath the falling sickness. No, Caesar hath it not, but you and I, an honest casca, we have the falling sickness. I know not what you mean by that, but I am sure Caesar fell down. If the tag rag people did not clap him and hiss him according as he pleased and displeased them, as they used to do the players in the theater, I am no true man. What said he when he came on to himself? Mary, before he fell down, when he perceived the common herd was glad he refused the crown, he plucked me open his doublet and offered them his throat to cut. And had I been a man of any occupation, if I would not have taken him at a word, I would, I might go to hell among the rogues. And so he fell. When he came to himself again, he said, if he had done or said anything amiss, he desired their worships to think of it was his infirmity. Three or four wenches where I stood cried, alas, good soul, and forgave him for all their hearts. But there's no heed to be taken of that. If Caesar had stabbed their mothers, they would have done no less. And after that, he came thus sad away. Aye. Did Cicero say anything? Aye, he spoke Greek. To what effect? If I can tell you that, I'll never look you in the face again. But those that understood him smiled at one another and shook their heads. But for mine own part, it was Greek to me. I could tell you more news, too. Marullus and Flavius for pulling scarfs off Caesar's images. I put to silence. Very well, there was more foolery yet, if I could remember it. For this time, I will leave you. Tomorrow, if you please to speak with me, I will come home to you. Or if you will, come home to me, and I will wait for you. I will do so. Till then, think of the world. Well, Brutus, thou art noble, yet I see thy honorable metal may be wrought from that it is disposed. Therefore, it is meet that noble minds keep ever with their likes, for who so firm that cannot be seduced? Caesar doth bear me hard, but he loves Brutus. If I were Brutus now and he were Cassius, he should not humor me. I will this night in several hands in at his window throw, as if they came from several citizens, writings all tending to the great opinion that Rome holds of his name, wherein obscurely Caesar's ambition shall be glanced at. And after this, let Caesar sit him sure, for we will shake him, or work worse days endure. It must be by his death. And for my part, I know no personal cause to spurn at him, but for the general. He would be crowned. How that might change his nature, there's the question. It is the bright day that brings forth the adder and that craves wary talking and walking. Crown him, that, and then I grant we put a sting in him that at his will he may do danger with, and therefore think of him as a serpent's egg, which hatched would, as his kind, grow mischievous and kill him in the shell. The taper burneth in your closet, sir. Searching the window for a flint, I found this paper thus sealed up, and I am sure it did not lie there when I went to bed. Get you to bed again. It is not day. Is not tomorrow, boy, the Ides of March? I know not, sir. Look in the calendar and bring me word. I will, sir. The exhalations whizzing in the air give so much light that I may read by them. Brutus 
thou sleepest, awake, and see thyself, shall roam, etc. Speak, strike, redress, Brutus, thou sleepest, awake. Such instigations have been often dropped where I have took them up. Shall roam, etc., etc. Thus I must piece it out. Shall Rome stand under one man's awe? What? Rome. My ancestors did from the streets of Rome the Tarkin drive when he was called a king. Speak, strike, redress. Am I entreated to speak and strike? O oh, Rome, I make thee a promise. If the redress will follow, thou receivest thy full petition at the hand of Brutus. Sir, March has wasted 14 days. Tis good. Go to the gate. Somebody knocks. They are the faction. O oh, conspiracy, shamest thou to show thy dangerous brow by night when evils are most free. We are too bold upon your rest. Good morrow, Brutus. Do we trouble you? I have been up this hour awake all night. Know I these men that come along with you? Yes, every man of them, and no man here but honors you, and every one doth wish you had but that opinion of yourself which every noble bears of you. Uh, this is Trebonius. Trebonius? He is Trebonius. welcome. This is uh, Decius Brutus. He is welcome also. This is Casca. This is Cinna. And this is Metellus Simber. Give me your hands all over, one by one. And let us swear our resolution. No, not an oath. If not the face of men, the sufferance of our souls, the time's abuse, if these be motives weak, break off, off the times, and every man hence to his idle bed. So let high-sided tyranny range on till each man drop by lottery. But if these, as I'm sure they do, bear fire enough to kindle cowards and to steal with valor the melting spirits of women, then, countrymen, what need we spur but our own cause to prick us to redress? Shall no man else be touched but only Caesar? Decius, well urged, I think it not meet. Mark Antony, so well beloved of Caesar, should outlive Caesar. We shall find him of a shrewd contriver, and you know his means, if he improve them, may well stretch so far as to annoy us all, which to prevent, let Antony and Caesar fall together. Our course will seem too bloody, Metellus Simber, to cut the head off and then hack the limbs, like wrath in death and envy afterwards. For Antony is but a limb of Caesar. Let us be sacrificers, but not butchers, yet, Metellus. Yet I fear him, for in the engrafted love he bears to Caesar. Alas, good Cassius, do not think of him. If he loves Caesar, all that he can do is to himself take thought and die for Caesar. And that were much he should, for he is given to sports, to wildness, and much company. There is no fear in him. Let him not die, for he will live and laugh at this hereafter. The morning comes upon us. I will leave you, Brutus, and friends, disperse yourselves. But all remember what you have said and show yourselves true Romans. Good gentlemen, look fresh and merrily. Let not our looks put on our purposes, but bear it as our Roman actors do, with untired spirits and formal constancy. And so good morrow to you, everyone. Brutus, my lord. Portia, what mean you? Wherefore rise you now? It is not for your health thus to commit your weak condition to the raw cold morning. Nor for you, your, 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 nor for yours either. You have ungently, Brutus, stole from my bed, 
And yesterday night at supper, you suddenly arose and walked about, musing and sighing with your arms across. And when I asked you what the matter was, you stared upon me with ungentle looks. I should not know you, Brutus. Dear my lord, make me acquainted with your cause of grief. I am, I am not well in health, and that is all. Brutus is wise, and were he not in health, he would embrace the means to come by it. Why, so I do. Good Portia, go to bed. Upon my knees I charm you by my once commenced, commended beauty, by all your vows of love and that great vow which did incorporate and make us one. That you unfold to me yourself, your half, why you are heavy, and but men tonight have had to resort to you. For here have been some six or seven who did hide their faces even from the darkness. Kneel not, gentle Portia. I should not need if you were gentle Brutus. Within the bond of marriage, tell me, Brutus, is it accepted I should know no secrets that appertain to you? Am I your self, but as it were in sort or limitation, to keep with you at meals, comfort your bed, and talk to you sometimes? Dwell I but in the suburbs of your good pleasure? If it be no more, Portia is Buddha's harlot, not his wife. You are my true and honorable wife, as dear to me as are the ruddy drops that visit my sad heart. Portia, go in a while. And by and by, thy bosom shall partake the secrets of my heart. All my engagements I will construe to thee. All the charactery of my sad brows, leave me with haste. What mean you, Caesar? Think you to walk forth? Caesar shall forth. The things that threaten me ne'er looked but on my back. When they shall see the face of Caesar, they are vanished. Caesar, I have never stood on ceremonies, and yet now they frighten me. There is one within. Besides the things that we have seen and heard, recounts most horrid sights seen by the watch. A lioness hath whelped in the streets, and fierce, fiery warriors fought upon the clouds, and ranks and squadrons, and right form of war which drizzled blood upon the capital. The noise of battle hurtled in the air. Horses did neigh, and dying men did groan, and ghosts did shriek and squeal about the streets. O oh, Caesar, these things are beyond all use, and I do fear them. What can be avoided whose end is purposed by the mighty gods? Yet Caesar shall go forth, for these predictions are to the world in general, as they are to Caesar. When beggars die, there are no comets seen, but the heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. Of all the wonders that I yet have heard, it seems to me the most strange that men should fear, seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. Alas, my lord, your wisdom is consumed in confidence. Do not go forth. Call it my fear that keeps you in the house and not your own. We shall send Mark Antony to the Senate house, and we shall say that you are not well today. Let me upon my knee prevail in this. Mark Antony shall say I am not well, and for thy humor I will stay at home. Here is Trebonius. He shall tell them so. Caesar, all hail. Good morrow, worthy Caesar. I come to fetch you to the Senate house. And you come in very happy time to bear my greetings to the senators, and tell them that I will not come today. Cannot is false, and that I dare not falser. I will not come today. Tell them so, Trebonius. Say he is sick. Shall Caesar send a lie? Have I in conquest stretched my arm so far to be afraid to tell graybeards the truth? Trebonius, go tell them Caesar will not come. Most mighty Caesar, let me know some cause, lest I be laughed at when I tell them the so. The cause is in my will. I will not come. That is enough to satisfy the Senate. But for your private satisfaction, because I love you, I will let you know. Calpurnia here, my wife, stays me at home. She dreamt tonight she saw my statue, which, like a fountain with a hundred spouts, did run pure blood, and many lusty Romans did, came smiling and did bathe their hands in it. And there does she apply for warnings and portents and evils imminent. 
and on her knee hath begged that I will stay at home today. This dream is all a misinterpreted. It was a vision, fair and fortunate. Your statue spouting blood in the many pipes in which so many smiling Romans bathe signifies that from you, great Rome shall suck reviving blood and that great men shall press for tinctures, stains, relics, and cognizance. This, by Calpurnia's dream, is signified. In this way, you well have expounded it. I have, <laughs> when you have heard what I can say, and know it now. The Senate have concluded to give this day a crown to mighty Caesar. If you shall send them word you will not come, their minds may change. Besides, it were a mock apt to be rendered for someone to say, break up the Senate till another time when Caesar's wife shall meet with better dreams. If Caesar hide himself, shall they not whisper, hello, Caesar is afraid. Pardon me, Caesar, for my dear, dear love to our proceeding bids me tell you this, and reason to my love is liable. How foolish do your fears seem now, Calpurnia. <laughs> I am ashamed that I did yield to them. Give me my robe, for I will go. The Ides of March are come. Aye, Caesar, but not gone. Where is Metellus Cimber? Let him go, and presently prefer his suit to Caesar. He is addressed. Press near and second him. Casca, you are the first that rears your hand. Are we all ready? What is now amiss that Caesar and his Senate must redress? Most high, most mighty, and most puissant Caesar, Metellus Cimber throws before thy seat and humble I heart. must prevent thee, Simber. These couchings and these lowly courtesies might fire the blood of ordinary men and turn pre-ordinance and first decree into the law of children. Is there no voice more worthy than my own to sound more sweetly in great Caesar's ear for the repealing of my banished brother? I kiss thy hand, but not in flattery, Caesar, desiring thee that Publius Simber may have an immediate freedom of repeal. What, Brutus? Pardon, Caesar, Caesar, pardon. As long as to thy foot does Cassius fall to beg enfranchisement for Publius Simber. I could be well moved if I were as you. If I could pray to move, prayers would move me. But I am constant as the northern star, of whose true fixed and resting quality there is no fellow in the firmament. That I was constant, Sibber should be banished and constant do remain to keep him so. O oh, Caesar. Hence, will thou lift up Olympus? Great Caesar. Doth not Brutus bootless kneel? Mm. Take hands through me. Mm. Eight to Brute, then fall Caesar. Liberty, freedom, tyranny is dead. Run hence, proclaim, cry it about the streets. Some to the common pulpits cr and cry out. Liberty, freedom, and enfranchisement. People and senators, be not affrighted. Fly not. Stand stiff. Ambition's debt is where, paid. Where is Antony? Fled to his house, amazed. Men, wives, and children stare, cry out, and run, as it were doomsday. Fates, we will know your pleasures. That we shall die, we know. Tis but the time and drawing days out that men stand upon. Why, he that cuts off 20 years of life cuts off so many years of fearing death. Grant that. Grant that. And then is death a benefit. So are we Caesar's friends that have abridged his time of fearing death? Stoop, Romans, stoop. Let us bathe our hands in Caesar's blood up to the elbows and besmear our swords, then walk we forth, even to the marketplace, and waving our red weapons o'er our heads, let's all cry, peace, freedom, liberty. Stoop then, and wash. How many ages hence shall this our lofty scene be acted over in states unborn and accents yet unknown? But here comes Antony. Welcome, Mark Antony. Mark Antony. Oh, mighty Caesar. Doth thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests glories? Triumph spoils shrunk to this little measure. Bear thee well. I do beseech ye, if you bear me hard, 
Now, whilst your purpled hands do reek and smoke, fulfill your pleasure. Live a thousand years, I shall not find myself so apt to die. No place will please me so. No mean of death, as here by Caesar and by you cut off, the choice and master spirits of this age. O oh, Antony, beg not your death of us. Though now we must appear bloody and cruel, as by our hands on this our present act you see we do, yet see you but our hands, and this the bleeding business they have done. Our hearts you see not, they are pitiful, and pity to the general wrong of Rome, as fire drives out fire, so pity, pity, hath done this deed on Caesar. Antony, for your part, to you our swords have leaden points, our arms in strength of malice, and our hearts of brothers' temper do receive you with all kind love, good thoughts, and reverence. Your voices shall be as strong as any man's in the disposing of new dignities. Only be patient till we have appeased the multitude beside themselves now with fear, and then we will deliver you the cause why I, that did love Caesar when I struck him, have thus proceeded. I do not doubt your wisdom. Let each man render me his bloody hand. First, Mark is Brutus, will I shake with you? Next, Caius Cassius, do I take your hand? Now, Decius Brutus, yours, now yours, Metellus, yours, Cinna, my valiant Casca, yours, though last, not least in love, yours, good Trebonius. Gentlemen all, friends am I with you all, and love you all, upon this hope that you will give me reason why and wherein Caesar was dangerous. Or else were this a savage spectacle. Our reasons are so full of good regard that were you, Antony, the son of Caesar, you should be satisfied. That's all I seek, and am moreover suitor, that I may produce his body to the marketplace, and in the pulpit, as becomes a friend, speak in the order of the funeral. You shall, Mark Antony. Brutus, a word with you. You know not what you do. Do not consent that Antony speak at his funeral. Know you how much the people may be moved by that which he will utter? By your pardon, I will myself into the pulpit first and show the reason of our Caesar's death. What Antony shall speak, I will protest he speaks by leave and our permission, and that we are contented Caesar shall have all true rites and lawful ceremonies. It shall advantage us more than harm us. I know not what may fall, I like it not. Mark Antony here, take your Caesar's body. You shall not in your funeral speech blame us but speak all good you can devise of Caesar, and say you do it by our permission, else shall you not have any hand at all about his funeral. And you shall speak in the same pulpit whereto I am going, after my speech is ended. Be it so, I do desire no more. Prepare the body then, and follow us. Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth that I am meek and gentle with these butchers. Thou art the ruins of the noblest man that ever lived in the tide of times. Woe to the hand that shed this costly blood. And Caesar's spirit, ranging for revenge with Ate by his side, comes hot from hell. Shall in these confines with a monarch's voice cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war that this foul deed shall smell above the earth with carrion men groaning for burial. Satisfied. satisfied. We will be satisfied. be satisfied. Let us be satisfied. I will hear Brutus speak. Be patient. Then follow me and give audience, friends. I will hear him speak. The noble Brutus is ascended. Silence, silence. Be patient till the last. Romans, countrymen, and lovers, hear me for my cause, and be silent that you may hear. Believe me for mine honor. 
and have respect to mine honor, that you may believe me. Censure me in your wisdom, and awake your senses, that you may better be the judge. If there be any in this assembly, any dear friend of Caesar's, to him I say that Brutus's love to Caesar was no less than his. If then that friend demand why Brutus rose against Caesar, this is my answer. Not that I loved Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more. Had you rather Caesar were living and die all slaves than that Caesar were dead to live all free men? As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. As he was fortunate, I rejoice at it. As he was valiant, I honor him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. There is tears for his love, joy for his fortune, honor for his valor, and death for his ambition. Who was here so base that would be a bondman? If any speak, for him have I offended. Who was here so rude that he would not be a Roman? If any speak, for him I have offended. Who was here so vile that will not love his country? If any speak, for him have I offended. I pause for a reply. None, 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 Brutus, none. none, Brutus, none. none. Then none have I offended. I have done no more to Caesar than you shall do to Brutus. The question of his death is enrolled in the capital, his glory not extenuated, wherein he was worthy, nor his offenses enforced, for which he suffered death. Here comes his body, mourned by Mark Antony, who, though he had no hand in his death, shall receive the benefit of his dying, a place in the commonwealth. As which of you shall not, with this I depart, that as I slew my best lover for the good of Rome, I have the same dagger for myself, when it shall please my country to need my death. Live, 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 live. Live. Bring him with triumph home into his house. Give him a statue with his ancestors. Let him be Caesar. Caesar's better part shall be crowned in Brutus. We'll bring him to his house with shouts and clamors. Peace, silence, Brutus speaks. He's ho. Good countrymen, let me depart alone. And for my sake, stay here with Antony. Do grace to Caesar's corpse and grace his speech tending to Caesar's glories, which Mark Antony, by our permission, is allowed to make. I do entreat you, not a man to part save I alone, until Antony have spoke. Stay, stay, ho, and let us hear Mark Antony. Let him go up to the public chair. We'll hear him. Noble Antony, go up. For Brutus' sake, I am beholding to you. What does he say of Brutus? He says, for Brutus' sake, he finds himself beholding to us all. For best he speak no harm of Brutus here. Mm. Guess this Caesar was a tyrant. Nay, that's certain. We are blessed that Rome is rid of him. Peace. Let us hear what Antony can say. You gentle Romans. Peace. Peace. Oh. Let, us Let, us Let us hear him. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar not to praise him, the evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives here home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. 
When the poor hath cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal, I thrice presented him with the kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. He thinks there is much reason in his sayings. If thou consider rightly of the matter, Caesar has had great wrong. Has he, masters? I, I fear there will be a worse come in his place. Mark ye his words? He would not take the crown. Therefore, tis certain he was not ambitious. If it be found so, some will dear abide it. Poor soul, his eyes are red as fire with weeping. There's not a nobler man in Rome than mm. Antony. Now mark him, he begins again to speak. But yesterday the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there, and none so poor to do him reverence. O oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honorable men. I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honorable men. But here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. It is his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds, dip their napkins in his sacred blood, Yea, beg a hair of him for memory, and dying, mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. We'll hear the will. Read it, Mark. The will. The will. The will. 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 Read the will. will. Have patience, gentle friends. I must not read it. It is not meat, you know, how Caesar loved you. You are not wood, you are not stones, but men, and being men, Hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you. It will make you mad. His good, you know not that you are his heirs. Uh -huh. For if you should, oh, what would come of it? Read the will. We'll hear it, Antony. You shall read us the will. Caesar's will. Will you be patient? Will you stay a while? I have o'ershot myself to tell you of it. I fear I wrong the honorable men. Whose daggers have stabbed Caesar, I do fear it. They were traitors. <laughs> Honorable men. The will! The will! The will. Yeah. Read the, the will. will! They were villains, murderers. The will! Read the will! If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do remember this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. T'was on a summer's evening in his tent the day he overcame the nervii. Look, in this place, ran Cassius' dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made, and through this the well-beloved Brutus stabbed. And as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it as rushing out of doors to be resolved if Brutus so unkindly knocked or no. For Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, O oh you gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindest cut of all. Oh, piteous spectacle. Oh, noble Caesar. Oh, woeful day. Traitors, villains. Oh, most bloody sight. We will be revenged. Revenge! Revenge! Fire burn! Let the fire! Stay, countrymen. Peace, there, hear the noble Antony. We'll hear him. We'll follow him. We'll die with him. Good friends, sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. 
They that have done this deed are honorable. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not, that made them do it. They are wise and honorable and will no doubt with reason answer you. I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I am no orator, as Brutus is. But as you know me all, a plain, blunt man that loved my friend, and they that know full well, that gave me public leave to speak of him, for I have neither wit, nor words, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. I tell you that which you yourselves do know. I show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor, dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus and Brutus Antony, there were an Antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar's that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny. Mutiny! We'll burn the house of Brutus. Go away then, come, let's seek the conspirators. Yet, yet, yet hear me, countrymen, yet hear me speak. Peace, 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 peace. Let's hear him, noble most Antony. noble Antony. Why, friends, you go to do you know not what. Wherein hath Caesar thus deserved your loves? Alas, you know not. I must tell you then, you have forgot the will I told you of. The, the will. will, most the will. Will. The will. Let's Let's hear the will. will. Here is the will. And under Caesar's seal, to every Roman citizen he gives, to every several man, 75 drachmas. <gasps> Here was a Caesar. When comes such another? Never, never. Come away, away. We'll burn his body in the holy place and with the brands fire the traitors' houses. Take up the body. Go fetch fire. Pluck down the benches. Pluck down the forms, windows, anything. Tear down, pluck down, yes. burn, 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 burn. Now let it work. Mischief thou art afoot. Take thou what course thou wilt. Following Caesar's death, Antony and Octavius, Caesar's grand nephew and adopted son, conspire to kill 70 senators and other followers of Brutus and Cassius and seize control of Rome. They raise an army to battle the forces aligned with Brutus and Cassius. Brutus's and Cassius' forces occupy the high ground, but Brutus makes the fateful decision to meet Antony and Octavius at Philippi. Fearing that his forces will soon be depleted, Cassius objects. I do not think it good. Your reason? This it is. Tis better that the enemy seek us, so shall he waste his means, weary his soldiers, doing him offense, while we, lying still, are, fill, are full of rest, defense, and nimbleness. Good reasons must, of force, give place to do better. The people twixt Philippi and this ground do stand but in a forced affection. For they have grudged us contribution, the enemy marching along by them, by them shall make a fuller number up. Come on refreshed, new added and encouraged, from which the advantage shall we cut him off. If at Philippi we do face him there, these people at our, at, are at our back. Hear me, good brother. Under your pardon, you must... Note beside that we have tried the utmost of our friends. Our legions are brim full. Our cause is ripe. The enemy increaseth every day. We at the height are ready to decline. There is a tide in the affairs of men, which, when taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omitted all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves, or lose our ventures. Thereafter alone, Brutus is confronted by the ghost of Caesar, who ominously tells him he will meet Brutus at Philippi. Antony's and Octavius' armies are victorious. Left encircled, Cassius commits suicide, and then Brutus the same, running into his sword held by his servant. The play is concluded with Antony and Octavius commenting on the death of Brutus. Brutus was 
the noblest Roman of them all. All the conspirators, save only he, did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He only, in a general honest thought and common good to all, made one of them. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. Mm, according to his virtue, let us use him with all respect and rites of burial. Within my tent his bones tonight shall lie, most like a soldier, ordered honorably. So, call the field to rest and let's away depart the glories of this happy day. Thank you very much. And now we'll ask Dean Reuter to come up and we'll begin the second half of this program, the panel discussion. We're all set, I think. I am, uh, as Dan Kelly mentioned, Dean Reuter. I want to thank you all for being here. And uh, I'm here to lead the discussion and try and contemporize things, bring things up to speed for us to the, to the modern day. I want to thank uh, so, uh, the entire cast, first of all. Um, congratulations, Dan, and director Stephen Mailer, and all the players. That was a terrific uh, rendering of the play. There is a lot of territory covered in this play. And uh, you know, in the scene when Caesar was being persuaded and then dissuaded to go down to the Senate, uh, my wife leaned over to me, and she distilled it into one sentence. Husbands should always listen to their wives. <laughs> But, but I want to turn us more to executive power and the, the state of things today in our republic. The events uh, that we heard about in the play, Julius Caesar, describing the moment, as Dan mentioned, the Roman Republic was lost and the Roman Empire was born, take place over 2,000 years ago. Uh, there were too much executive powers being concentrated in one person. Sometimes even just the mere threat of it uh, caused action in, in the conspiracy too much consolidated power, uh, which we abhor. Shakespeare, of course, wrote about this over 400 years ago. Uh, but just over 200 years ago now, Benjamin Franklin, one of our founding fathers, walked onto the street at the close of the Constitutional Convention and was asked, what have you given us? Franklin responded reportedly without hesitation, a republic, if you can keep it. So our own republic, thankfully, has something a strength and an undergirding that a lot of republics don't have, and that is a written constitution. It's an unusual animal at the time it was adopted. But even with that written constitution, are we doing a good job of keeping our republic? Is too much power being consolidated in any particular office or group of people? I would argue maybe that it is, but I'm the moderator, so I'm not gonna make much of an argument. <laughs> Uh, the genius of our Constitution, though, this is the United States Constitution, of course, I'm talking about, lies in its separation of powers. It separates powers vertically and horizontally. So the federal government gets some powers, the state governments keep powers. Within the federal government, power is separated between three branches. And the vesting clauses of the Constitution, we're back to high school civics here now, um, don't allow for any branch of government to give its power to any other branch of government. The idea is that no single actor or small group can deprive you or me of our liberty. So that's how we got to where we are today. Um, that's our written constitution in a nutshell. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the horizontal separation of powers in particular, the division of powers between the three branches of the federal government, began to be deliberately undermined about 100 years ago or so. Uh, under a theory promulgated by Woodrow Wilson. He was one of our presidents. He was not president at the time he promulgated this theory, but his idea was that the administrative branch of government, the, the part of the government that actually administers the government on a day-to-day -day basis, should be populated with learned experts who are not accountable to politics. They're really outside the tawdry business of politics. That was his vision 
that efficient experts insulated from tawdry politics and outside influence could do a better job. Of course, he came up with this not as president, but as an outside expert insulated from tawdry politics. He was exactly one of the experts that he felt could run the government best. Unfortunately, I believe Wilson's uh, design is antithetical to the Constitution that I just outlined. Uh, so the problems really began 100 years or so ago with Woodrow Wilson. Uh, and then federal power, particularly in the executive branch, grew in a couple remarkable phases during the Roosevelt administration and during the Johnson administrations, but it's grown steadily under all administrations, essentially, for decades. Meanwhile, the states have given up power to the federal government. Sometimes they've done that willingly. Sometimes they've done that unwillingly. Uh, sometimes they've done it formally and sometimes informally. But we've seen government power rise from the people to the states to the federal government. And then at the federal level, once the power is at the federal level, we've seen it move over to the executive branch. And it's no one person's fault. It's no one branch's fault. It's everybody's fault. As I said, the states gave up power. We've given up power. Uh, Congress delegates sweeping powers to the executive branch, to the agencies. Congress will pass a law that says little more than we want clean air. Do what you need to do to get that in, in, in the interest of public policy. They don't give a lot of details. Uh, so Congress is delegating legislative authority. Uh, there are uh, powers of the purse that Congress just doesn't exercise. It can uh, control agency action by controlling their spending, but Congress doesn't pass budget bills anymore. Uh, it has created self-funding agencies, so there are agencies of the executive government uh, that don't need to go to Congress to get their money, and therefore they don't have a lot of accountability to Congress. Uh, and Congress doesn't provide a lot of oversight in terms of oversight committees. They tend to be scandal-driven oversight uh, rather than really meaningful oversight. And the courts have a hand in this too. The courts are not innocent bystanders. They are bystanders, but they're not innocent bystanders. Uh, they've allowed Congress to delegate all this authority, and then with regard to the agencies themselves, they sort of take a hands-off approach. They tend to defer to the agencies. So this elaborate system of government that Dan outlined in the Roman Republic, we've sort of duplicated here, uh, but I think we've not paid a great deal of attention uh, to some of the details over the past 100 years. And I think we're getting to a point where there is there are vast powers exercised in the executive branch of government, and the question arises, uh, are we being responsible stewards of our own republic? Those are among the, some of the issues we're gonna discuss tonight, but we're gonna uh, get started now with opening remarks from our two panelists. Uh, I wanna thank again Jennifer Braceres for, our, I guess you were the understudy to, uh, <laughs> to David Everyone French. Everyone needs an understudy. Uh, but we're going to begin with Carol Rose. So Carol, your, your first thoughts, please. Thank you. Wonderful. It's nice to be here. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for this wonderful opportunity. It's been great, great fun. You know, one of the questions that's often asked about Shakespeare, um, is, is he trying to say that we make history or that history makes us? Um, in the story on its face, of course, the conspirators believe that if they eliminate Caesar and they will save the Republic, that they will make history. Right, of course, but the Republic ultimately isn't saved, even after they kill him. An empire rises in the form of Octavius Caesar and Mark Antony, and even the ghost of Julius Caesar. So then the question for us is, here we are after 200 years, is our Republic destined for a rise of authoritarianism, or can we, whether we're patriarchs or plebeians, do something to stop it? You know, I think there are some interesting parallels between the play and what we're facing here today in our country. I just thought I'd point out a few. One is this notion of self-delusion and hubris on the part of the patriarchs. Um, you know, recall the early scene between Cassius and Brutus, where Cassius says, tell me, good Brutus, can you see your face? No, Cassius, for the eye see not itself, but by reflection in some other things. Do you wonder how many politicians on both the right and the left believe that they alone can save the Republic? Shakespeare reminds us of the self-delusion that we're all victim to. Another re resonating or parallel I see in today is the rise of rhetoric triumphing over reason to stir the masses. You know, the ACLU is nonpartisan, of course, but I couldn't help but think when we have Brutus versus Anthony of the debate last Monday. 
Clinton versus Trump. There are rhetorical tricks that each of them you know, it, it takes on that we hear today with politicians. You know, when, when Antony says, I am no orator, and then proceeds to be a great orator, right? Uh, or Caesar refusing the crown three times. You know, how false is that? But most interesting is the shameless self-promotion of Mark Antony. You know, he strips off the shroud, the bloody shroud, and shows Caesar's wounds and calls them a piteous spectacle and whips up the frenzy of the mob and of the ple plebeians. And he unleashes them. Well, you know, today, do we have that happening today, the frenzy of the mob? Are we seeing this with infotainment, where we merge news and facts and politics and entertainment into one thing and we whip people up into a frenzy where they're no longer paying attention to what's really happening, but instead become engaged in the infotainment approach, the continuous, continuous campaign and political cycle? A third parallel I see, so I see the patriarchs being somewhat self-delusional. I see the rhetoric rising over reason. Think about the changing role of the masses, of the plebeians themselves. And if you think about the trio of Coriolanus, Julius Caesar, and then Antony and Cleopatra, it's very interesting. In the first play of the Roman trilogy, you see the plebeians have a role. They say a lot. In Julius Caesar, they're, they're there, but they ultimately vote Caesar into power. They're whipped up. They become spectators. And then they go away, and the part that we didn't read was then they go off and they kill a poet uh, because of his bad prose, among other things, <laughs> which is very funny <laughs> coming from Caesar. Um, but in Antony and Cleopatra, the, the plebeians have no role at all. They're just spectators, so they disappear. That's the real sign that the, that the republic is gone. And again, is that happening today? Are we, are, are we losing the engagement of the people in the republic as they become distracted, if you would, with bread and circuses? And then the last point I thought was an interesting parallel is the, is the corrupting influence of wealth that Shakespeare writes about in the play. There's a lot, a lot of references to the corrupting conquest of the, the world and how money corrupted Rome, how the patricians became very, they were buying offices, they were buying the office of the tribune, which was supposed to represent the people, buying the office of the council. And even the plebeians become corrupted. In the first scene where the cobbler says, why am I, why am I marching? Not because I care about what's going to happen with our republic, but because I want them to wear at their shoes so I can profit, right? So even the cobbler wants to make a buck. Um, and you know, it's interesting to ask that question today. There's been a lot of uh, uh, news around, a lot of commentary about uh, these days, are the ratings really driving what's going on in terms of our commentary, uh, the profit motive, even amongst the institutions that are supposed to be representing the people and the plebeians. So in, in conclusion, thinking, so what do we do? Like, what can we do to prevent our republic from slipping further into empire? And I think one thing that I noticed, and I kept reading it as with the lawyer's eyes, was where were the police? Where were the judges? Um, I think we need and we have a strong civil society. We have an independent judiciary, um, which I might also add is quite eloquent, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, we have citizen activist groups like the Federalist Society or the ACLU, um, all these groups that are out there that enable citizens to stay engaged and not to become distracted just by the bread and circuses. We have the media. Where's Jeff Jacoby? Um, always, always important to uphold the state. And then I guess finally I would say that we have the arts. Um, you know, the arts, law and the arts, but beyond the law, we have the arts which are transformative in how we can engage ourselves, how the people can become engaged in the arts, it's truly transformative. And as Shakespeare says, it enables us to hold up a mirror to ourselves that we wouldn't otherwise see. We can't be self-deluded when we hold up that mirror. And so I guess in conclusion, if you ask what is to be done to save the Republic, well, for my answer, let's do Shakespeare. <laughs> Jennifer Berceris. Well, I think Carol might be surprised that I agree actually with, with <laughs> m much of what she said, um, not all of it. But I think we can all agree that one of the things that makes the Shakespeare plays so interesting is their timeless application. Um, and the fact that you can view them through so many different lenses. Um, of course, you know, as a lawyer and also now a journalist in the 21st century, um, there are two main lessons that leap out at me from this particular play. Uh, the first is a psychological one. Um, and that is simply really that ambition and greed and jealousy 
are just a core part of the human condition that aren't going away. Um, and that is why basically we see this story replayed over and over again throughout history, throughout literature, even on Game of Thrones when Jon Snow is killed and I don't know if anybody watches Game of Thrones, but Ollie comes up at the end and um, gives the last stab and, and Jon Snow basically says, you know, and you too, Ollie. Um, so we see it repeated over and over again as a metaphor, um, a metaphor for the human condition and for ambition and greed and, and all of those traits that, you know, we like to think we don't harbor them, but the more powerful people become, the more these negative traits tend to come out. And I think that was part of the point of the play as well, <laughs> that, that power corrupts. And although you might start off thinking that you're doing things for Rome, um, in reality, many of us act out of self-interest, particularly politicians um, on both sides of the political aisle. So that's sort of the first lesson I see uh, from, from this play. The other one is the, is the one that Dean talked about and that Dan talked about at the beginning, which is really one of political and constitutional theory. Um, and that is the lesson that, you know, power concentrated in the hands of a few leads to that corruption. And that's, that's what Madison wrote about in Federalist 47 when he said, even if our leaders are elected, even if they are chosen by the people, that concentration of power in the hands of a few will ultimately lead to tyranny. Um, so some of you might remember with respect to this, the second lesson, the constitutional lesson, um, that we actually did this show 10 years ago um, with much of the same cast, and many of you might have been here. Um, and the question then is now was how much executive power is too much executive power? But the difference is that there was a Republican in the White House then. And if memory serves me, many of the people on the stage thought that George Bush had assumed much too much power. Um, and the focus was on some of the signing statements that he used um, when signing legislation, portions of which he viewed as unconstitutional. Um, and we also talked at that time a lot about the Patriot Act and whether Congress had given too much executive authority to the president in the aftermath of 9-11. Um, so my, you know, my question sort of for our panelists and audience members who may have been here at that time is whether we are today equally concerned um, with too much exec executive power now that there's a Democrat in the White House. Um, and are we as concerned with rewriting our immigration law or our gun laws as we were with signing statements and the Patriot Act. Um, I would just, I'd throw that out there and ask people to think about that because it does seem to me as a journalist and an, you know, sort of a, an observer of politics for many years that unfortunately it often depends on whose ox is getting gored and not really on the constitutional first principles um, that these things really actually should be based on. Um, with respect to the first point, which is the more political, psychological point about ambition and um, politicians in general, it's very tempting, I think, to analogize Donald Trump to Julius Caesar. And it's been done in much of the media. Um, George Will, uh, has written quite eloquently about that, and I, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with that analogy. Um, one thing that struck me as we rehearsed for this play was the part where one of the characters said, uh, you could kill their mothers and they'd still forgive Caesar. <laughs> it reminded me of when Trump had said, I could walk out in Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and these people would still vote for me. Um, so I, I do think that there are many parts of this play that are evocative of the candidacy of Donald Trump. But I'd like to propose another analogy. Um, and that analogy really has Caesar as the establishment. And I say that 
as somebody who's sort of part of the establishment. Most people on this stage are part of the establishment or the intelligentsia, so to speak. Um, but like it or not, the establishment over the past several years, decade, has gotten a dirty name and has at least, is at least perceived by many people as not being responsive to the voters and the will of the voters. Um, so I would argue that, that you could make the analogy that Caesar stands for the establishment. Um, and amongst the cast of characters that that would include would be, of course, all of the leaders in Congress, McConnell, Boehner at the time, uh, Paul Ryan now, the Bush family. Um, and I, in reading this play over and thinking about the political implications, really see Ted Cruz in the role of Brutus. Um, Ted Cruz is somebody who Dave, uh, Judge Barron and I both had the pleasure of serving with on the Harvard Law Review and nothing against Ted Cruz personally. Um, but he is somebody who, like Brutus, was part of the establishment, um, who was friends with the Bush family, who used the establishment to his own benefit, um, and then came back to Washington and essentially betrayed them. Um, he ran against the Washington cartel. All of his rhetoric was aimed at bringing down the establishment of which he had been a part. Um, and I think, like Brutus, he really underestimated the power of Mark Antony, who I believe is the Trump in this equation, and I think Carol does too, based on her remarks. Um, I think that, you know, we see in the play, we saw Brutus sort of blow off the notion of Antony being a serious threat. Um, I think we saw Ted Cruz do that throughout the campaign um, when he, you know, would call Donald his friend and he sort of groveled for the Donald supporters and, and his campaign strategy was that once he knocked off the establishment candidates, Bush and Rubio primarily, and once Donald's flash in the pan and 15 minutes of fame were over, that the voters would line up behind him. But like Brutus, he underestimated um, the power of Donald Trump's rhetoric. And Donald Trump, like Mark Anthony, whether he's, whether he's playing the American public or not, you know, I'll let you be the judge of that. But we see in this play, um, Mark Anthony come before the people of Rome and say, I am just a plain and blunt man. I'm not an orator like Brutus. And, that's essentially what, what Donald Trump has done. He's, whether it's at his convention speech or in the debates, he is speaking over the media. He's speaking over the heads of the establishment, over the intelligentsia, directly to the Tea Party and the American people, and he's speaking to them in their language. And I don't know what the result will be. I don't think anybody can predict at this point what the result will be. But I do think that this election, um, that this play tells us a lot about the law of unintended consequences and what happens when you rise up against Caesar, you may get something worse. We're gonna open it up to the rest of the panel now. Ultimately, we're gonna to turn to the audience for questions. Thank you. <laughs> do any of our other players have an immediate comment? Yes, sir. Well, I do, and, and I... Uh, well, just one second. Jennifer and... Dean and Carol, can you guys slide back a little bit? Sure. We can all see everybody's head in as well. Um, very, very oh, quickly. That's actually not a bad idea to, to introduce oh, the people who are on the stage. Oh. Uh, why don't you if, you, if you would introduce yourselves as you speak for the first time. Yes, that would be. My, uh, my name is Michael Greco. I'm a lawyer in Boston. And uh, 11 years ago, I had the honor and privilege of being president of the American Bar Association. And the reason I mention that is that uh, when I uh, asked the American Bar Association to do a survey of the knowledge of the American people of their government, uh, I was astounded. 44% of those polled could not identify the three branches of government. 44% uh, 
could not tell what uh, separation of powers means. This means there is a lack of knowledge, ignorance of the Constitution of the United States. And the very opening comment made uh, about Ben Franklin when they came out of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia and the people wanted to know what kind of a government are we going to have? And Franklin said, a republic if you can keep it. What did he mean? He meant that in a democracy, in a republic, the guardians of the government are the people. And if the people don't know, if they're ignorant, then they don't know that their rights are being taken away. They don't know that a, a US president uh, is uh, uh, preventing Congress from doing its task by uh, announcing that, yes, Congress just enacted this law, but I'm going to attach to it a presidential signing statement, which means I'm not going to enforce this law, taking power from Congress. And when the president says, and the reason I'm doing this is that I find that this act is unconstitutional, that's taking power away from the US uh, uh, Supreme Court. What's the solution? Simplistically, go back to what Franklin said. The course that I took when I was 12 years old in junior high school in Illinois was a full year civics, civic education course. We learned everything there was to learn about the, about the government, the way it functions. Do you know where that course is taught now? Nowhere. Nowhere. There are some states that have 15 minutes a gym teacher will, will instruct uh, once a week. That's why I appointed the ABA uh, Commission on Civic Education and the Separation of Powers. Each of the 50 states controls education. We were able to get a dozen of those states to reintroduce the civics course. Because without knowledge, without an understanding of their government, they will not keep it. They will not keep a republic. I want to take one step back and, and see if there's consensus among the group that there is a concentration of powers in, in the federal government in the first instance and within the federal government in the executive branch and the agencies. Do, do folks have strong opinions on that one way or the other? It seems to me there's a great deal if, of if you power. Could, I'm sorry, the first time you speak, I'm if you sorry, could introduce Ria there's a great deal of power in the Congress, which, which is not being exercised. And it's causing, it's causing the imbalance that everybody is complaining about. But I think that's where it is at the moment. And I haven't figured out how it can be resolved. But, but short of the kind of incursions uh, that you're talking about. But you recognize an imbalance in the first instance, that the agencies. I do. There okay. isn't, well, there is not a theoretical imbalance, but there is an right. actual imbalance, because one of the three branches simply isn't doing what it's supposed to do. Is it just one branch of government, or are there other branches of government doing, <laughs> not doing what they're supposed to do? I think at the moment it is, it is in the Congress, and, the, and therefore the others are mm. reacting. I think part of the executive enlargement of itself is a response to the Congress, inability to do what it is supposed to do. As at the presidential debates, please hold your opinion. Uh, Judge Barron, were you going to, you were leaning forward. I don't know if you had something to say on that point or. I'm sorry. I'm speaking to Judge Barron, sorry. I don't quite know how to put this. When, when my father uh, used to give me a curfew, the curfew was don't stay out too late, which is kind of perfect because you could easily be violating it without knowing it, and you could be complying without knowing it. And to some extent, I think the genius of the system of checks and balances and why it's lasted for such a long time is it's not, I think, as prescriptive as maybe your initial rendition of it suggests it is. It's a system. And it's designed to be a system. It's designed to encourage debate and disagreement and conflict, even over whether the system is in balance or out of balance. The really difficult thing is to know whether you're in a crisis with respect to that. Mm -hmm. That's a constant subject of debate. It's not new today. It's what's going on. Woodrow Wilson, the reason he came up with his theories and why others did and why they were implemented was because they thought they were facing a crisis. And you know the, the saying by Franklin that if you have a republic if you can keep it, that there's another version of that, which was uh, Chief Justice Marshall saying, remember that it's a constitution that we're expounding. And what he meant by that was that it was designed to address the various crises of human affairs, which means 
he was from the get-go perceiving that maybe these lines were more gray than black and white. That doesn't fully answer your question, but I think we can lose sight of the larger context, which is, and this to me is sort of the most significant thing about the Julius Caesar play now, which is remarkably, for all the change in the system, it remains a constant. Right? The expectation is that when there's an election, one side leaves, the other side comes in, and roughly speaking, we have the same government in form that we had uh, beforehand. And, and while there's many room, much room for disagreement and concern at various times, that fundamental fact about the system is a great achievement. Of the country. It is true. I think the final question of the debate the other night was, would you uh, support the President of the United States, assuming the other person was elected? And they both answered in the affirmative after some uh, hemming and hawing, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the question then becomes, I think, Judge and others, how, how do we know when we're in a crisis and, uh, or how do we anticipate a crisis? And is, is an uninformed uh, plebeian class, if, if uh, Mr. Greco has it right, uh, is that, uh, does that put the elites uh, in the unfortunate position of having to anticipate the crisis, having to solve it? Um, are, are we then still a republic? Are we an oligarchy? What, what does all that mean? I, I think you're touching on something that Jeff maybe, I, I'm Jeff Jacoby the, uh, from the Boston Globe. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, themes that comes through clearly in this play is how fickle and malleable public opinion is and how one good speech can get them all uh, uh, thinking Caesar should be killed and another speech comes along and thinks how terrible it was that Caesar was killed. Uh, polls didn't exist then, uh, but it's not that different from here's what the poll said yesterday, and here's what the poll says tomorrow, and here's what the real clear politics average of polls will say next week. And the idea that public opinion is, is the great determinant that we should all be following isn't all that different from at least part of the premise on which Mark Antony was operating. And I think that when, uh, at least part of what Franklin had in mind when he said a republic, if you can keep it, and, 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 and uh, what was alluded to before, uh, if, if the public does, if, if the public doesn't do the job of keeping its republic, the power of emotion to sway the mob, to inflame the mob, and the danger that comes when, when the mob is, is empowered uh, could well destroy the republic. Uh, there's a whole lot of um, uh, uh, talk about the separation of powers of the government and, 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 and branches of government. I actually would disagree a little bit about Congress being, uh, being guilty here. I think that there's far too much power concentrated, <laughs> you'll all pardon me, in the judicial branch, uh, which, which is, which so, is say far- Say more about that, Which Jeff. is far less subject, <laughs> which faces far less of the, of, the, of the balances and checks that the framers built into the system. Uh, but there's also a kind of concentration of power in mass opinion. And if there was one thing the framers all hated, whatever their opinion was, it was the idea that mass democracy and, and you vote and that decides it uh, had any kind of legitimacy to it. They built fail-safe after fail-safe and uh, mediating institution after mediating, mediating institution to make sure that public opinion wouldn't dominate and control. And yet, one by one, so many of those protections have been stripped away to the point where now, if you get a plebeian class, to use your term, uh, that you know, that doesn't know what's flying, it can end up being bamboozled and, and rampaged into making terrible decisions that the whole country then has to live with. But it's an interesting thing that um, years ago, um, I remember during the Reagan years, you know, there was a lot of condemnation by various elites that the people were stupid, that how could they elect this actor? And, but there was sort of a, it, it, and by and large, I think, you know, there, there are people still critical of Reagan, but people think that the, that the people made a good job, made a good decision in terms of electing him, but but then people talked about sort of an intuitive sense among the plebeians, the common people, that they may not be smart, they that they may not be educated in, in in the sense that all of us are here on the stage, but they have an innate sense of common sense and decency and virtue by the fact that they were raised in families and went to church and went to schools that actually taught civics, that although they may not, if you stuck a microphone in their face and asked them to name who their two senators were or uh, when World War II ended, 
they, they had enough uh, of, of an education and a notion of civic virtue that they would make the right call. I mean, that, it's sort of a line with Bu William F. Buckley's old line that he'd rather be governed by the first hundred people in the telephone book than you know, the elites. But, but my fear today, yes, exactly. <laughs> my fear today, which is, I think, evidenced by the rise of Trump, is that we've lost that. Um, we've lost that there's something that's fundamentally gone, which goes directly to Franklin's concern about if you can keep it. And I'm echoing a little bit what all people are saying, but I, um, I am genuinely fearful that we are in a crisis. Um, and we are left with two um, uh, choices uh, which um, um, leave me wanting. Um, and, I, and I fear for the republic. I, I, I want to add to the discussion. Identify yourself Nancy you. Gertner. Um, I want to add to the discussion. I mean, I, I have some of the same fears because when you look at the power of the mob in Julius Caesar, I kept on thinking of Twitter. I kept on thinking of social media, where at least there was a, a, a manipulated gathering, but a gathering of people that were speaking to one another. Uh, there is something so dissolved about the media today. Everybody talks about that. And then in addition, Jeff and I, on our way back from one of the, uh, the last rehearsal, was also talking about the dissolution or the diminution of mediating institutions like the, the, like the press. I mean, the, the, and, and while, uh, you know, the, at the time that, that the Constitution was, was drafted, there was, a, there was a different kind of press. Uh, not a lot of people could read, but nevertheless, there was a different kind of press. And the absence of, a, of mediating institutions, mediating institution in civil society that talk to one another is, in fact, quite troubling, which then gets back to the first point, which is the most that we can hope for then are institutions that are, that are sort of in a dialectical relationship with one another. Congress, the, the executive, the judiciary, and um, that's kind of the, the usual framework of checks and balances. Uh, what the, the danger here would be if any one party won all three branches, won two branches and essentially took over the third. That would be a crisis. That would be a crisis. And it, just, to, I, I also wanted to, to give equal share to um, the dev, Democratic candidate. What, what I was struck by Antony's speech was, um, and perhaps the most persuasive part about Antony's speech was that all of us commoners were going to get 75 drachmas, right? <laughs> we were all going to get a big fat check which is essentially what the Democratic Party, and even Trump in many ways, is promising. We're going to give it to you all. We're going to give you free college tuition. We're going to, we're going to uh, give you all your jobs back. I mean, that kind of appeal, I think, is insulting to people's intelligence. Um, but yet people are very, very, especially an uneducated class, a, a group of people, and by class I don't mean poor people versus rich, I mean people who who no longer care or think about politics, it's very appealing and it's very, very dangerous. And, um, and I think Nancy's right that civic in, mediating civic institutions need to get involved uh, and, and begin a dialogue so that we end this spiral. So, uh, I'm Martha Coakley, a former attorney general. If I can jump in on two points. First, I think we underestimate the role that states have taken on in terms of governance, laboratories of democracy, challenging the uh, marriage equality. You know, that came from the states, challenging federal agencies on climate change. So the states are smaller and have been able to work more nimbly with people without the bureaucracy that's become frozen in Washington. And I think that is filled in a vacuum for the inactivity of what is happening at the federal level. That creates a problem for a country this big and that it's become so divisive. But the second thing I just want to say, I totally agree about the civics issue. I, I mean, I did criminal prosecution for too long not to see the effects on young people who didn't understand their civic responsibilities. And that's obviously something we need to do. But I also just want to say, you know, we're living in an unprecedented time. This country almost fell apart in 2008 to 2010. 
we almost fell apart during the Civil War. But the level of education, even though we have a huge income inequality, healthcare, education, the ability that people have in this country, which is why we have people from other countries who want to come here because of that, is unprecedented. And maybe, maybe we should all work really hard until election day and then have this discussion the day after and see, see what happens. <laughs> Jennifer. I, I mean, I actually think, to Martha's point, people have access to more information than ever yes. before in the history of the world. And although I share your concern about civics, I, I just asked my husband, I never shut up about it when my kids come home from school and they're not learning these things. And believe me, the superintendent and principal hate my guts for beating that drum. I, I think it's incredibly important, but I don't think it's the lack of civic education is the sole or even the primary reason we're seeing what we're seeing today. I think one of the reasons we're seeing at least the popular response to Trump um, is quite frankly that people do feel that the elites, including everyone on this stage, um, have talked down to them for too long. And they're tired of the political correctness and they're tired of the president wagging their finger at them and telling them that he knows better and their reaction is to go in the other direction and, and to, to say, you know what, we're done with that. I don't, I'm not happy about Trump. I'm a conservative. I'm a, I've been a Republican almost my whole life. But as an observer of politics, I, my gut instinct is that that's why we're seeing this. You know, in a country of 310 million people, however many we are, you can always find a substantial population that will, uh, uh, be evidence for almost any theory. And it's certainly true that there are an awful lot of people out there among the electorate who, who have that feeling. Just um, talk to them. But, uh, but I'm not sure that if, that, but, but at the same time, there are an awful lot of people who clearly aren't bothered by the idea of having a president who wags their finger and, and tells them what to do. Uh, look who the Democratic Party has I, nominated I have, for president. I have talked to many, many Trump supporters no, no, I, I and agree. asked them, I, I agree. I'm, why I'm are saying, you there are many, him? There are many people who will feel that way and, and many, many people who won't feel that way. Um, I actually would, would pick up on yet another theme of Caesar, Julius Caesar, which is that he wanted himself, he had named himself dictator for life. He wanted himself to be crowned king, to be crowned uh, uh, emperor uh, with absolute power. I would say if you're really going to look for an even deeper root cause of the crisis that we find ourselves in now, uh, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders won't agree with this, but I would say it's the idea of a government that has become so all-powerful that it affects everything that every community and every society and every individual in that society is able to do and can choose to do. Uh, you know, to go back to the 75 drachma point, it's, it's remarkable to go on the presidential campaign trail uh, for in, in New Hampshire, for example, when you know, they're spending all this time going, uh, going door to door and meeting to meeting. And you listen to groups of people who are talking to would-be presidents of the United States, and overwhelmingly what they talk to them about are not great national issues of state. The kinds of things that come up over and over and over again in the questions that they put to them are things like, uh, my daughter's having trouble getting this kind of uh, uh, approval for a certain aid program. Well, you know, what can you do about that? Or, you know, my, my mother can't get her Social Security uh, agreed on. Uh, you know, how will you make that better? And presidential candidates pander to this desire to have Big Brother solve all their problems for them. You get into that mindset, and it's not surprising that we're in a crisis. But I do think when you talk about the public, we can't just be talking about the people who are decrying political correctness. We have the Black Lives Matter movement, and there are people who are decrying inequality, and there are people who are decrying discrimination. And so it seems to me that the public that we're talking about that are being arguably ignored uh, by, the, by, the, by the government includes, it's a much more complicated public than, than that, which we have to consider as well. So the other side of political correctness is equality talk, is speaking about rights, which it seems to me has been a, a, an advantage of our country for the longest time. I, I think we don't know what this phenomenon is. I think that there's a complexity to the public and there's a way in which we're talking down by homogenizing it in this conversation. And that com complexity we see in the demonstrations and the, the outcry on the streets. So 
I, I'm, I'm not sure that the public is one thing. The public is discontented, but I'm not sure it's discontented in the same vector as you're describing. Well, I think that's one of the interesting things about Trump is that he is drawing support from constituencies that you would not expect. And obviously his numbers are lower among certain groups, but mark my words, he's gonna get a higher percentage of the minority vote than Mitt Romney did. Mark my words. This is an accomplishment? I, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying it's good, bad, or indifferent. I'm saying, I'm saying that what we're observing in terms of this Support for Donald Trump for president is, is not a left-right thing necessarily. And I think anybody who thinks that it is, is misunderstanding the rise of Trump. And if we misunderstand the rise of Trump, it's going to repeat. This is not a, a right-wing ideologue we're dealing with. This is a populist who- Well, actually, is a, he's a demagogue. He is a demagogue. He's a demagogue. He's a demagogue and a populist, and he is- creating a realignment like we have not seen before. Whether he wins or not, the Republican Party is changed forever, and our politics are changed forever. I begin to fear we're not going to solve this problem this evening. <laughs> uh, I think, do we have our, are we at the 10 minute or 15 minute mark? Should Dean, I'm sorry to take the mantle from you. Please but, do. Uh, uh, we, we have to leave. The theater needs us out. But thank you so much for coming. And thank you for the Okay.